When you hear the name Buzaki, what comes to mind? Perhaps uh, transport logistics, dairy, or politics. Well, not far from it. Mr. Kiprok Bundetich is the executive director and founder of Buzeki Group of Companies, a major business conglomerate in Kenya. He is self-motivated and resourceful entrepreneur with a sharp business acumen, has developed the Buzeki Business Group to emerge as a major player in East Africa. He has immense wealth of experience spanning more than 14 years in the transport, logistics, and dairy industry, which has been effectively utilized to provide a solid foundation for all the Buzeki Group ventures. Well, we get an opportunity to sit with him on Know Your Leader to have a great conversation. Stay with me, Abulatsia Imbukwa, as we have this conversation. How are you doing this morning? I'm very well, I'm very well. And uh, let me take this opportunity to invite you to my home here at uh, Ainapkoi. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can feel we are at the, uh, the highest point in Rift Valley, maybe. You know, we are 2,800 meters above sea level. And uh, yeah, so welcome to Ainapkoi. Thank you so much. Well, people identify you as this billionaire, but who is Buzeki? Now, let me start by uh, the, the word you've just uh, mentioned to give a reference to the description people give uh, or, 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 or make of Buzeki. When you say a, a billionaire, first and foremost, I'm a billionaire at heart, you know. The, 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 billion we, the billionaire on wealth can be argued, but at heart, yes. L let me just uh, consider that at the very onset that I'm a billionaire at heart. On who Buzeki is, I am uh, everything that you've said in your intro. You know, I am uh, a businessman. I am a politician. I am a farmer. I am a church elder. Church elder, yeah, nice. I am a philanthropist. And above all, I am a, a patriotic Kenyan. And uh, a patriotic Kenyan who is making a lot of effort to ensure that my contribution towards leadership and being a politician makes this country a better place for all Kenyans. Nice. That is the representation that I deliberately bring on the table. And that is a decision I made from the time I, I chose to pursue politics as a, a personal interest that obviously has an objective of serving the citizens of Kenya and improving their welfare. Not nice um, to your level where you are right now. You have come from a point of hawking milk to this point where you are right now. Of course, there are things you have had to do to rise to your level. So what are those guiding principles that you employ in life? First and foremost, let me uh, just take a cue on what you said on the issue of uh, hawking milk. Yeah, for sure, I was, uh, I was hooking milk in, in Mombasa. My, my first job was a, sales, was a salesman in a milk factory in Kilifi. And uh, I remember my first salary was 80 shillings wow. a, a day, you know. And then, basically, I was, I was employed to, to actually offload milk uh, from the van. I was, I was not even a salesman then. And then, because of my hard work, and commitment to my job. My, my boss then, a South African uh, uh, guy, old man called Road Kane, decided to promote me to be a salesman. And then I didn't even know that I had a talent in, in selling, to be honest. I didn't know. Because by the time I was 
given the opportunity to be a salesman. I had no formal accreditation. I had no formal training of being a salesperson. It was just an in, in it uh, uh, skill that I had, you know, so, so something that, that I didn't know as a young person. So when I was given an opportunity to go and sell milk, then I became a very successful salesman. And eventually I ended up becoming a, a sales manager in Kilifi Plantations. And thereafter I decided that uh, I had plateaued on, on the sales manager's job. And I decided to uh, give a shot at business. And I decided to do the, a business that I already had uh, some formal background, you know. So having been a, be, be, been a salesman, I decided to go and start my own distribution in Mombasa. And I distributed milk in Mombasa for eight years, you know, started shop to shop until I became one of the biggest distributors in Mombasa. Then I was selling Tuzo. And eight years down the road, after having been a distributor for eight years, I, I eventually went back and actually bought over the factory of my former boss, Kilifi yeah. Plantations. Chris Wilson sold for me the factory. And then the rest is history. I ended up uh, expanding and buying another milk factory in Molo, and we ended up buying another milk factory in, in Limuru in Kiambu. And in the process in between, in 2004, I diversified to logistics. You know, in as much as people think Buzeki is more of a logistician, you know, because maybe trucks yeah. carry my big name and uh, they move from point to point, so they are, uh, they, 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 they market me as they, as they transverse the northern corridor from Mombasa to Kampala. But my forte, my, my bread and butter, my, my face is a milkman. And that's why I love dairy farming, that's why I love agriculture. And, and the story about me ha uh, having a liking for milk is also something that is a little bit cultural because uh, where you are doing this interview is my, is my home. My, my, my family home, where my mother is, is across the road on the other side, maybe a kilometer from here or less, maybe 800 meters. And in my early days as a child, the, the only economic activity that we had in our home, in the Bundotitz family, was dairy farming. And out of the milk that was sold to KCC then, mm -hmm. is how I was, I was able to go to school. You know, we, we didn't have uh, uh, somebody in our family. None of my parents uh, had a big job, a, a big white collar job. They were just peasant farmers. And yeah. we worked hard to be able to make ends meet. So uh, basically, you know, I, I've been able to grow from, uh, you know, there's a story they say from uh, grass to grace, if, if you like. So, you know, I, I, I've been through the cycle and I understand what an ordinary Kenyan goes through on a day to day. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm a guy who has slept hungry. I'm somebody who has uh, shared cubicles with, uh, with, with, with people of my age and uh, we have survived and I'm very, uh, actually I find myself very lucky. You know, at times you think some of the things that you go through as a young person, comparatively when you look to other young people like you who may have come from affluent families, you, you always feel like uh, I'm disadvantaged. You know, you may end up looking down upon yourself and you start playing pity with your soul. But I want to tell young people, appreciate who you are and, and go through the process. Because if I didn't go through being a hawker and uh, the challenges that come with establishing a business, today I would not be the leader that I want to be. Because I would need so much to learn from young people on what they are going through. Uh, young entrepreneurs on, on their failures and successes. But I have gone through all this at a personal level. So I basically bring a lot of skills, a lot of experience, which I think will enhance my leadership position in, uh, in as far as the gubernatorial contest for Wazengishu is concerned. Awesome, awesome. In your, manifest, in your manifesto, what are those programs you have for the youth? Because I, uh, uh, from what you have said, I feel you have the youth at, the, at heart. And right now we have Generation Z that believes in um, instant gratification. They don't want to go through the process. So do you have 
projects for the youth that will spark the desire to, for them to to go through the process to get whatever they they, they yearn to get. And that's a very good question. And uh, one one of the challenges that any uh, in, in youth faces by by virtue of their age, and and by virtue. Of, of, of their environment and their peers is, is, is that uh, they, 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 they do not have patience. Youth ha have a very short fuse when, when it comes to having the capacity to wait. And when I talk about waiting, I'm talking about you know, being patient in all fronts. You, know, you, you need to be patient even when you are uh, developing a friendship with, with, with another peer or, or with a mentor. And what we can do to be able to help the youth to understand that patience is a virtue is actually people like me and others to mentor them. So one of the things that I've always done very deliberately is to mentor the youth to, to, as, as a standing example. You know, when they hear it from me and I tell them, Look, the, the, the biggest asset that you can uh, invest in as a youth right now is your character first. Because the youth always have this idea that I need working capital, I need a job, which is okay. You know, not all of them will get jobs, not all of them will get working capital. But what they can work on for free and, and eventually it will position them strongly such that when they get the capital on way or when they get the employment opportunity they 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 they, they can grow very quickly and, and even recover the the time they uh, you know they imagine they wasted because of patience so one of the things that we have to do me and many other leaders in Kenya I impress upon them to come out and have programs programs for mentoring i remember one time i visited south africa before i tell you what i, I intend to do for the youth and when I was in Johannesburg, I, I visited a Richard Branson business incubation center. And as I, I was actually invited there as, as a Kenyan entrepreneur to just go and listen, and eventually I was given two or three minutes to just give a parting shot. And, you know, I, 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 I felt that this sort of incubation center is something that is worth being done globally. You know, and I intend to come and do that incubation center here in Wazingishu, where we have a place where the, the renowned, established uh, success stories, be it in media, be it in uh, business of, of, of whatever industry, I want to invite those people to come to Wazingishu and mentor the youth on my behalf. You know, they can listen to me, but I don't want them to listen to me every day. I also want them to have an opportunity to, to hear from other people. Yes. You know, on, on, on how they did their thing, because everybody has a way. Every, you know, the journey to success, the outcome of every person is to be able to succeed. But the, the path to that success, you know, is, is different for everybody. But, you know, the, the outcome of the word success is, um, is, 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 is a shared uh, point of destiny for all of us. So I would want to first and foremost say that I'll have an incubation center where I'll encourage uh, you know, success stories to come and mentor the people who are in Gishu. But now let's talk of more tangible issues of, of what we need to do. One of the things that I really feel sorry for, for the people of Kenya and the people who are in Gishu, especially the young people, is that they do not have facilities to harness their talent. And you know, talent is God-given. It's something that you don't buy with money. Mm -hmm. It's something that you are born with. It's a, it's a, a free gift to, to the parents of the child, and it's a, a free gift to the child himself or herself, and it's a free gift to the society where that, that child is born, the country, and the world, you know? So I want to put in interventions that will ensure that we tap a talent at its very raw form and find by way of policy and this we have to do by way of policy it cannot be 
just a specific intervention by Buzeki. I have to come to the County of Assembly of Ozingishu and say, okay, let's set up a framework for tapping talent. Mm -hmm. It's needless for you to come and identify an athlete at the age of 21 mm -hmm. when already the, the, his knees and his ankles are starting to dry up, you know, all the grease that is here is already starting to wear out is when you are identifying such talent. We need to be able to nab this talent at the bud when they are just, you know, at high school, which is what has made America a real success story when it comes to athletics and sprinting is that they are able to tap this talent when they are 14, 13 years old. So that is something I intend to do for athletics because we know Wazingishu, you know, is, is a powerhouse of athletics. But I want to have a program with all primary schools that will be coordinated at the county so that once we get a name forwarded to us from a primary school like the one here, here, in Apkoi Primary School, and they say, we think this child has uh, the talent to be able to run 800 meters. Then we have the facility that we are setting up in a place called Chagaya, which is just at the border of Nandi County and Wazingishu County. Mm -hmm. We will set up uh, an athletics academy where we will have boarding facilities, we'll have coaches and everything. So that would help me to tap the talent for the runners, the athletes at the primary level, take them there. Football. We need to set up a football academy. And you very well know that we have a lot of uh, at least four or five big success stories of Kenyan football. We have Wanyama in Tottenham. We have Mariga who played for Inter Milan. We have Origi, uh, you know, who was in Liverpool. And, and the father of Origi is William O'Koth, who used to play for Gorma here, you know. I've been a football fan for many years, and, and, I, and, and I know William O'Koth, on the days he used to play with people like Dao. And eventually his son went to, I think, Belgium and then went to England. These guys are earning top dollar. You know, in a week they are earning 15 to 20 million in a week. So it's a pity that we have such talent in our countries that is not harnessed. So I'll also develop a football academy so that we can be able to, uh, you know, identify youth who are talented. Uh, on football and eventually see how we can have connections for them to get trials in Belgium, in France, in Italy. Mm -hmm. And if we get one success story of somebody earning 20 million a week, I, did, I was privileged to, let me just give you what, what, what this can do to a community. One day someone calls me and tells me that uh, Wanyama, the, the, the Tottenham uh, player, wants to transport, because I'm a transporter, he wants to transport a hundred containers mm -hmm. to Bungoma. Wow. And I mean, I, I just found out that these were containers for material and accessories because he's setting up a football academy in Bungoma. And I was like, look, look, I mean, this talent would just have been lost here and we would never have seen such, uh, such great development out of talent. So talent for me is very close to my heart. And let's now go to the, what we refer popularly as wasani, you know? This is a huge industry. It's, 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 it's a sleeping giant. I, I think Nigeria uh, ha, have already taken off with, 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 with Niger. Yeah. And, 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 and I mean, I, I would imagine that generates a lot of revenue for uh, the, 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 the people who have, who have the talent of, uh, of acting, uh, you know. And in Wazingishu, for example, there is no facility. We don't have a cultural center, you know, where talented uh, artists uh, ca can come and have a platform to, to, to even uh, do their productions, you, you know, record series of, of TV series that they can sell. DSTV, all that they sell, they buy content from people, you know, they, they do not produce. So th this is something that we must put a lot of effort, invest in a lot of money in the interest of the youth. And then obviously there is the other issue of creating opportunities for the youth. The reason why Kenya is not able to create jobs for the youth is because of contractors. The contractors in Kenya take all the money away from everybody. Because when they want to do one kilometer of road, they come and say a kilometer will cost 40 million. I mean, maybe 
his total cost may be 50% of that, so he'll have 20 million per kilometer that he will use to uh, 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 enrich himself deservedly because you know he has not stolen from anybody. But I want to change this. I want to make sure that we create job opportunities for the youth by developing internal capacity to be able to do those contracts. Mm -hmm. So instead of me giving money to a contractor to go and do for me a road at, uh, for 40 million per kilometer, I want to bring a Chinese consultant to come and be in charge of the Wazingishu infrastructural development company that we are going to set up so that the 40 million that I would have paid out, I use it to employ a lot of jobless youth and then we do the roads ourselves, we do the dams ourselves, you know, we do projects and keep the money within the county so that I can employ. I know this is not a very popular story with contractors, but that is my thinking, that it's now getting to a time where we are saying we are a poor country. We are not going to allow few people to take all the money, have 20 homes like this, while others are living in, uh, in slums. While others have to strangle people at night to get a dollar to put food on the table and somebody else is carrying 40 million. This is a mentality that we must change in this country that a selected few will carry top layer plus the meat and the bone and then you throw the sufuria away to, 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 to whatever little soup is remaining for others to scramble. If we do not change this, then we're going to have a problem and I think the change can start here with, in Wazingishu with me, where I'm going to ensure that uh, the interest of the youth will be taken care of I in every sense. So, you know, I would not be able to uh, put up everything on, on five minutes, but more or less, you know, that's the broader framework of my intentions to and my plans with the youth of Wazingishu. What uh, lessons can I drop from your businesses? You have a group of companies that you have learned that are successful. So, what uh, lessons can I learn from you to enable that, to ensure that my business thrives? Number one, which is my secret. And it's a, free, it's a free secret. I mean, everybody has access to it. You know, since you woke up this morning, me and you and everybody else here has, uh, we have the same uh, amount of time until tomorrow morning. It's 24 hours for me, you and everybody else. For young people, what can draw a line between you and your peers is the amount of time you put on the job. I remember in my heydays in 1999, me, I used to work for 19 hours. So you can imagine, when I'm putting in, if you're doing eight hours a day in a month, assume you even work every day, that is 240 hours, isn't it? If I'm doing 18 hours, it's 540 hours, you know, in a month. And you, you are doing 240. I'm doing 300 hours more than you. In, 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 in one year, maybe if my figures are right, it will be almost 36,000 36, hours or something crazy like that. So by the time we are doing one year, I'm actually doing one year, seven months. How will you match me? This is how I beat people in my market because they could not just understand. When people are coming out of rave at 2 a.m. in the morning, you know, the, my, my canters are loading milk. And you cannot match me, even the person, even if you are cleverer than me. If I put in more hours, I perfect and I become good in what I do, I'll beat you in a time. So I want to encourage young people that the only way you can be able to, uh, to, to put a very strong foundation in what you do is put in the man hours. Man hours means you are becoming, you are creating more time for your customers. Man hours means you are paying more attention to your business. Man hours means you are going through the conveyor of, 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 of the learning curve more intensely and, 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 and in a very robust way. And, and, and so you, you, you quickly uh, come out of the learning curve. You know, when somebody else is taking five years for the learning curve, for you, you take two and a half years because of the time you're putting in. And sooner than later, y you know, you have perfected what you do. So I want to encourage young people that one of my secrets is to be able to put in man hours. There is nothing that you can ever be rich without feeling pain on your skin, unless you win charity, which I've tried many times. I've won 5,000 once. You know, it's, it's not very easy, yeah. you know. So 
these things of charity don't, don't, don't work. And, and the only thing is you have to work until it's so painful. And success will never come easily, you know? But uh, you must also now develop a thick skin to be persistent. So first and foremost, you put man hours, and then you be persistent. And, 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 and be very deliberately persistent and, and be very hard-headed about it. And make sure you always keep your head above water because there are days when you wake up in the morning and you feel like you want to give up. You know, you have a loan, you know your installment is coming tomorrow, you've not paid your rent. Uh, we've gone through all that, but you also have to talk your way out. You have to learn to talk your way out and also make sure you invest in your network. A lot of people spoil their net worth because I always tell somebody, your network is your net worth. And you need to do a test for yourself. When, when you are in need of money and you are in a, in a situation, take your phone, scroll over your phone and, and see which name of somebody you can ask for money and they can give you. If you scroll a lot of names and you realize there is nobody you are picking, then your net worth is very bad. <laughs> you know? And your net worth is bad either because you don't keep your word, you know, uh, you, 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 you are not good in, in developing friendship, you know, especially business friendship is very important when, when you should be always be able to have people who believe in you. If you tell somebody, I need 20,000, they should know that you are in need and they need to go out of their way to give you 20,000 because the day they ask you, you will also be able to help. So I tell young people, do not spoil. You know, you, you get excited, you've made some money, and all of a sudden you think you can change your friend. You had a contract you were doing together, and you think you've gotten your first five million. Ah, uh, you say, I'm the one who was doing all the things. You duck. Already, this person is going to talk to other 10 business people about what you did. So, make sure you continue growing your, your network, because your network is your net worth. That is what will develop you, because when you need something, a buddy will put in a good word. Oh, that person is okay. That person is fine. You know, tomorrow you want somebody to give you credit for goods, let's say 90 days. You go there, somebody will take a phone call. Oh, this guy came, he wants I give him credit. No, he's good, he's good, give him. And then you will tap into the, the network that you have started and the network of your friends and the network of the good vibe that you create. And so I've talked about man hours, I've talked about persistence, I've talked about your, ne your network. And the other thing now, to summarize it, is the discipline of money. If you don't have the discipline to be able to manage your money, I mean, regardless of, of how much money you make, because what happens is when you have, you develop a habit of just by indulging and, and spending money, it means when you make more, you spend more. Mm -hmm. And if you focus so much, so much on luxury, luxury has no limit. You know, it's very elastic. It, it expands. You know, it expands from uh, a, a, a Volkswagen GTI and uh, you go to a Touareg and you go to a V8 and you go to a, G, a, a, a Mercedes G, G class. It has no end. You will go eventually to a helicopter, you will go to a submarine. You know, it's limitless. It's, it's a pit. Yes. So you, you, have to, you just have to be measured. And I mean, I'm not trying to deny you your, your, your right to, to, you know, to overindulge, to overindulge and, 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 and live a lavish life. Uh, you know, you, you can put a, 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 a jacuzzi and a sauna in your house. I mean, that will not make you poor. I mean, if you're making money. But, but the point is, you, you, you just have to draw limitations. You have to draw limitations because, and, and let's bring it to a much more uh, realistic example of, of ordinary people. You see, yeah, yeah, young people will, will eventually, when they get money, within the first five years, they have three, four cars. Uh -huh. You know, you, 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 you have a one Prado, you have uh, a Subaru, you have uh, a, 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 a one Mercedes. It, it's at times unnecessary. It's unnecessary because you are not really rich, you, you, you are okay, you know, you are making money and, and you have the energy and, and life is promising and, um, and money is rolling in. But you forget that, uh, you know, 
you, you don't remain energetic forever. Yeah. You know, at one point, you cannot be a, as aggressive as you were 10 years ago. Uh, it will get to a point where we have a new generation of young people who are coming to the business market and you start becoming irrelevant, you know, just out of nothing. It's just pure at attrition and, and, uh, and a swap of, of the ones coming in and you guys being pushed. And, and you realize all of a sudden that your market share, whatever was so relevant 10 years ago about your product, is no longer relevant anymore. And yeah. if you have, at that point, not anchored yourself properly, then, then you realize that uh, you become poor very quickly. Even the, the, the perishable assets, the depreciating assets that you had bought have no value anymore. So it's important for, for young people to be able to learn the art of saving, the art of, uh, I'm not saying you be stingy, to be honest, but I'm just saying that uh, you, you, you have to just be disciplined about your money and, and do more of saving and invest more on, uh, on what we call uh, va va value-enhancing projects uh, or investments so that will not depreciate. So that uh, on a rainy day, you can be able to, to have something to fix some of the issues that will come. You'll you get to a place when you're no longer making money. At, at, sub at some certain age, you start uh, spending money, you know, for your health and everything else. And also the other thing I want to tell young people, make sure you have a health cover. Okay. Ever since I was, I started business in 99, I, I, I paid for my first AR, uh, insurance, health insurance license in 99. And I thank God today, touch wood, I, I, I've never used my card by the grace of God. But I've just seen a lot of friends who have gone through a lot of difficulties because of not having health insurance. Mm -hmm. You know, you are taken to one of these big hospitals, you have an emergency, and it wipes your two million and you go back to square one where you are. So I want to encourage all young people. In fact, if you are able to take a health care cover for yourself, and, so, and also your parents. If your parents are reliant on you, take cover for them because if you don't do that, they will eventually come for your pocket so that you pay. Mm -hmm. You know, we know NHIF is trying, but they'll tell you we'll pay for the bed 14,000 shillings, you have a bill of 600K. So these are things you have to ring first yourself ag 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 against, uh, you know, possible uh, money pilferages that, 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 that may be out of your control. You know, you have to think ahead. So one of them is having a health cover. Make sure your vehicle has insurance. We've seen very reckless young people driving your vehicle doesn't have insurance. Mm -hmm. You get an accident and somebody takes you to court. You didn't have insurance. They sue you for three, five million shillings and uh, you are gone. So we have to take those measures to make sure that you are well covered. Very, very powerful. Allow me to dissect the man, man hours. Mm -hmm. How is your typical day like? Uh, now, uh, my typical day during this campaigning period is uh, we're basically going to do rallies uh, and we leave at, uh, I wake up at five o'clock in the morning so that I'm just focused for the day. And uh, thereafter, we leave uh, for the rallies. We try to have three rallies per day, we are in some cases four. And I come back home at 8 p.m. in the evening, you know, and uh, try to process and do a little bit of analysis of the rallies that we had during the day. And uh, thereafter, you know, uh, obviously go to bed. You know, I am a, I'm a strict uh, teetotaler, so I am, I am permanently sober in that sense, you know. At times, I, 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 you know, when, when I lose it, it's not because of highness of the bottle, it's purely because of politics, when you get mad a little bit. And I have nothing against, uh, you know, people who obviously have a drink for, for their own, uh, you know, it's, it's, I appreciate it and I have friends for that matter, but, you know, for me, I think uh, I just need to be permanently sober. Uh, because of what I do, uh, you know, I, I need to wake up very early and it's not pleasant. I've drunk before, so to carry a heavy head for me doesn't work. You know, I'd rather be a little bit light, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I know. Yeah. You're a powerhouse. Any book in the pipeline or is there a book out there? That Definitely. And my book will be the most read book because, you know, there, there is so much I've gone through that I'm, I'm not able to tell you, but... Uh, 
one day I'll be honest with myself and everybody else and, and put everything about me on the table. And, uh, and I think it will be very enriching for entrepreneurs, for, for, for young people. You know, by the way, I've always told people, I've never benefited by any government uh, contract in my life. I have never held a, gov a government job other than being appointed to be chairman of the defunct Chemerin Sugar, which was moribund. We, we hardly did anything. I mean, they didn't even have a shilling to even buy uh, a cup of tea. I mean, it's a pity. The farmers, in the sugarcane farmers in that region are, are just uh, subjected to abject poverty, and yet they have a gold mine within their, their, their habitat, which is the, 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 the sugar... Uh, the environment they have for growing sugar. And do you know sh Kenya is a sugar deficit country? Do you know we import sugar? It's a pity. Like right now we are importing maize from Arusha. There is no maize in Wazingishu which we call the grain basket. G you know Gorogoro? Yeah. Gorogoro is 200 shillings. A lot of Kenyans cannot afford Gorogoro mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. It's too expensive. And, 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 and you know, this is something that Kenyans need to be very, the, our leaders need to be very concerned. If people cannot fill their stomachs personally, then we have, we, we have, we have a problem that uh, ne needs to be fixed. So I think sooner than later, my hope is to be able to, uh, eventually I'll do a book. Eventually, I also want to play a very big role in, in, in public speaking, especially on mentoring young people. Th that's a role I, I, I really would do with glee, with a lot of joy. Because it's some of those things that you live on earth. You know, nobody will ever know, not everybody will have a privilege to come to my house. But every person can have a privilege on, on, on me sharing the little knowledge that I have in, in masses through social media or through television or through what we are doing now. So th this to me is, is very valuable and uh, it's, 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 a good, it's a good discourse to, to, to pursue. Uh, because then it's the least I can do to make the world a better place. Mohesh, you're a powerhouse and sitting here having this conversation with you is a great honor for me and the people who are going to watch this interview. What, uh, your, what is your parting shot for your no. electorate now? I think my parting shot for Kenyans is uh, beyond these elections for 2022, Every Kenyan should be able to carry their responsibility and should, or rather should be able to carry their burdens based on the decisions they are going to make on the 9th of August. And I'm very deliberate about it. You see, these Kenyan, Kenyan people at times are a big let down, all of us, including me. I'm not saying I'm any better, but let me just talk generally and address everybody, including myself. You know, people go and vote for the wrong people. And then after that, you come uh, with all manner of complaints and, and, and lamentations and, and, and grievances. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, all of a sudden you, you need a shoulder to, to cry on. This is something that I want to appeal to all Kenyans. I'm not telling who you who to vote for but you better understand the person you want to vote for. What is it that you want for yourself? Do you want a, a leader who will come and improve your socioeconomic status? And when we talk about leaders, we are starting from the MCA, the member of the county assembly. We are coming to the member of parliament. We are coming to the women rep. We are coming to the senate. We are coming to the governor and the president. The onus is on every leader to exercise their right to vote and vote wisely. Free your conscience. I tell people, Kenyans, at times you don't have to vote to win. You see, we have this mentality that you have to win. At an individual level, me, I will vote for a person based on their philosophy, on their track record, on what they stand for, and of course the manifesto that they've sold. Whether they win or not doesn't matter for me, but I know I did the right thing. 
but I cannot live with carrying the burden of voting for a wrong leader who won, but eventually the leadership had no value or if anything became painful to the people who voted. It's, it's like you've taken a stick to beat your own hand, you know, when you vote for the wrong person. So Kenyans must start accepting the, the, the notion that you should vote for your conscience. Your conscience will never cheat you. You can never cheat yourself. You can cheat others. I can cheat you, but I can never cheat me because you know the truth, you know where your shoe pinches, and you know what you want for yourself. So go and vote for those right leaders. And we also have to live for the future. And there's no better example to use like Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King took a bullet to inspire the black American to say that there'll come a time and I have a dream. 100 years later, Obama became president. We need to start having selfless Kenyans. There is no better example today I would remember than Wangari Matai, mm -hmm. who today when you go to Karura Forest to go and cycle, you know, you know that it's out of her hair being plucked and being threatened that you can go to Karura Forest and, and enjoy some oxygen while she lies in a grave. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. And we need to, have, to start having Kenyans who may not necessarily have to be rich. You don't have to have the mansions and the houses and the vehicles that every politician thinks they may have. But stand for something. Stand for something that will necessarily not help you. It may not, you may not benefit from it at an individual level, but it will benefit generations to come. So this is one thing that as a politician, and in the goodness of time, I want to, that's why I'm an independent candidate. Mm -hmm. I decided to be an independent candidate because when some person sold their manifestos, I was not convinced. I was not, uh, they did not uh, persuade me to a point that I thought that, uh, you know, so I don't want to critique, mm -hmm. but I said, let me come and sell my manifesto to the people of Wazengishu. And you know, in our region here, if you are not in the regional party, for example, like UDA, you are obviously disadvantaged. But because I am not, uh, you know, it's not like I'm saying it's a matter of life and death. You, you have to make me governor or Wazingi should, should perish. No, I leave room for the people of Wazingi to make a decision. But they should be able and ready to live with the decision of their choice. You know, there was the famous statement that choices have consequences. So, you know, that's real uh, today and it will be real any other time when it comes to elective politics, the decisions that voters make. We respect, but then you also live with the consequences. Also, oh, very powerful. What is in your manifesto? My manifesto uh, has, uh, has three pillars. Of course, we have the social pillar, we have the leadership pillar, and we have the economic pillar. So in the economic pillar, we are talking about economic transformation. In the, in the social pillar, we are talking about social transformation. And, uh, and in the leadership pillar, we are talking about uh, basically public leadership. You see, what should a public, what should a leader who's been elected to office do? One thing, equalize opportunities for everybody. Do not equalize the results. You see, the problem is people want to equalize the results. You want to come and give people results. When you are focused on giving people results, then you, you will select a few people. I select you, I select him, chukua, chukua ni mewapatia. Which is actually doing leadership the reverse way. You need to equalize opportunities for everybody. When people tender, may the best bidder win mm -hmm. without necessarily somebody having. You know, I look at these tenders they put in newspapers. They should even stop advertising because you go and apply for a tender in the newspaper, you'll never get it. These are some of the things I want to come and change. Let me equalize opportunities. If somebody has bidded for a tender, we don't have to meet. If we have, you have met the requisite requirements for, for, for the bid, we should be able to give you because you deserve it. And then you work hard to, to deliver. So 
One of the things that we must do in Kenya is to equalize opportunities, not the results. Mm -hmm. And the other thing Kenyans must start believing in is the process, not the outcome. You see, at times we just think we want the outcome. If we all decide today we want the outcome without the process, then uh, we will become a society of uh, man eat, eat man society because everybody is just want the results. You know, you want, to, uh, you want a big house, you, you want a big car, you want your children to go to the best schools. You, you don't care about how they go. So you, you will take the government's kitty, you are an officer in procurement, you want your kids to go to the best schools. This is what this country must stop so that we can be able to have money to develop the social infrastructure. At this age and time, we still have people living in Kibera without toilets. At this age and time, we still have people even here in Wazingishu, in our shacks, who, who survive without water, clean water. These are the basic social amenities that every government must undertake. The cost of healthcare in this country is unaffordable. And I'm telling you, I cannot even afford my own health care. And I'm telling you, no Kenyan today can afford their own health care. You touch wood, you know, nothing happens to us. I pray God protects all of us. But in case you get sick, you go to these private hospitals. A month, you'll cough a million plus. A month. Money you don't have, your friends don't have, your relatives don't have, they will demand it from you on an invoice. You go to United Kingdom. I graduated the other day from the University of Lincoln. I did a degree on logistics. My first degree was on marketing. But eventually, after becoming a logistician for 18 years, I decided to do a degree on logistics. And I went to, to graduate, and that was on the 26th of April at the Lincoln Cathedral, a, a cathedral that is 900 years old. And I was staying with a friend. Healthcare in the UK is free. Mm -hmm. Free, free, free to the best hospital. Whether you have cancer, you have kidney problems, you have a heart problem, you will be treated. But this country is a country for the people who have money. If you are poor in this country, you have a problem. And this is something that we must all shout, starting from media, from me. We must find a way of ensuring that uh, we have a big voice for the very vulnerable, for the very poor. I know people who are sick today at home who can't go to hospital because they cannot afford 500 shillings. One of Vumilia. I mean, during uh, when I go to the campaigns, one day come and accompany us to the campaign for a full day. We will not miss to get three, four people. A country that cannot provide free Jaipur food for the disabled. Why can't we buy Jaipur's food for everybody in Kenya? It will not make this country poor. And if you give somebody a Jaipur food, they are able to walk without necessarily needing a support. You, you are pleased. I have found children who cannot listen. All they need is a device for listening. You put it here, they don't know where to get it. They don't know, you know, they, they, I mean, they are just there. These are problems that we need to fix at a leadership level. Thank you. So my manifesto captures all that, captures issues to do with the disabled, PWDs. Captures issues to do with the farmers, fertilizer, uh, value addition. We have issues to do with uh, the women, table banking, and also being able to put women in circles so that we can go and get money for women empowerment, other than what I put in the kitty. We have money in all manner of foundations globally that are willing to help women, but you need a structure. And, and you need to ha have a framework that you can b bring wannabe uh, uh, supporters or, or sponsors to, 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 to women empowerment. You know, we also have inside here issues to do with health, of course. A level five hospital, ambulances. We have 30 wards in Wazingishu. I have proposed to buy one ambulance for every ward and a state of the art ambulance. You know, at times people think ambulance ni kingora. You know, ile kingora inalie, ukiangalia ndani huko nyuma ni mkeka. There is nothing. So we, we need to walk the talk. And, and when we say it's an ambulance, it should be a real one. You know, an ambulance is the paraphernalia and the sophistication. Huko nyuma ya kuwakua maisha ya mutu. Sio kingora. You know, then we also have issues to do with the, these scholarships. And, and we also need to take a lot of young people to get jobs you know, over outside Kenya, Middle East, uh, Canada, all over. 
you know, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day in Poland, and Aniambia, he wants 70 youth who will be employed wachunge kuku. You know, they have a big uh, chicken uh, poultry thing. So I'm working on these kind of things so that we are able to help the youth waende wajitete kwa maisha. So all that is in this manifesto called uongozi niser. I don't want to be liked because nava miwani, or I be liked because uh, mimi uh, niko singekuwa mweusi siyo mweusi sana, niko na mapua straight nini, ah uh ah. -uh. You don't have to like me so much. You know, when I was in the world, I was like, 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 I I like, I I I I I I this video yeah. and this interview and mine is just to wish you all the best sure thank you very much asante sana appreciate it that is a, a, indeed a great conversation with the great buzeki and as he has said you have to ensure that you stand for something in this life as we head to the elections make sure you vote for leaders that stand for what you aspire for this is know your leader brought to you by me abulatsia imbukwa keep it success africa